All right, ready to dive in. We're tackling Flutter app performance today. You know, really cranking it up. And uh, you specifically mentioned isolates and streams. Oh yeah, those are good ones. Those are good areas to explore. Yeah, we've got that uh, that Medium article on using isolates. Yeah, for optimization. Yeah, exactly. And then a blog post that breaks down streams in Dart and Flutter. Sounds good. Yeah, I think by the end of this, you'll have the knowledge you need to really make those apps fly, you know? All right. Yeah, are you thinking about like any particular bottlenecks you're trying to address? Yeah, you know, I've been working on this app. It involves some pretty heavy data processing, mm -hmm. and it's starting to feel, you know, a little sluggish. Yeah. I have a hunch isolates might be the answer, but um, I don't quite know how to implement them effectively. Okay, yeah. And then there's that whole world of streams, right? Right. Which, you know, I know are powerful for managing data flow, but... yeah. I need a clear understanding of how to use them mm. without creating a bunch more complexity. Okay, I see what you're saying. Yeah, let's start with isolates. Okay. They're really perfect for uh, for offloading those heavy lifting casks you mentioned. Yeah. So instead of instead of making the main thread do all the work, right, which can lead to, you know, a janky UI. Yeah. You can use isolates to run those you know intensive processes in the background. Okay. Let them do their thing. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. You know, the Medium article, it calls Isolates Flutter's uh, Secret Weapon for Performance. Yeah. I like that. And they use these these fun analogies. Like, mm -hmm. they compare them to secret agents or space shuttles. Yeah. Each with their own specific mission, right? Right. And operating independently. Exactly. I love that. But when should I actually, like, call in these secret agents? Hmm. Well, think of it this way. If you've got a task that's that's... Going to keep the CPU busy for a while. Right. Like you said, crunching numbers or, you know, processing large images or parsing huge chunks of data. Right. That's that's a prime candidate for an isolate. Okay. You really want to keep those operations off the main thread so your app's UI stays, you know, nice and smooth and responsive. Okay. So if my app is doing like a ton of calculations or manipulating, you know, large data sets, mm -hmm. that's when I reach for these... Isolates. Exactly. That's that's a good time for it. Yeah. Now there's there's a couple ways to implement isolates. Okay. The article mentions that isolate dot run method. Right. Which is a you know nice little shortcut for those the simpler tasks. Yeah. But but for more complex situations where you need more control. Right. You'll you'll want to dive into like manually creating and managing isolates. Right. Okay. So it depends on on what you're doing and how much you need to to tweak things. Yeah. That's that's helpful. Knowing when to use each approach, I think. It'll save a lot of time. Yeah. And probably some headaches. Definitely. Yeah. And then there's always debugging. Right. How do you how do you track down, you know, issues when an isolate is, is off doing its own thing? Yeah, that's a good point. It's running its own show. Well, debugging isolates can be a little bit trickier. Right. But strategic logging is really your best friend there. Oh, okay. By placing, you know, log statements at key points. Yeah within your isolates code. Okay. You can get insights into what's happening. Right. And you can identify any, you know, bottlenecks or errors. Logging. Always there for the trusty sidekick. Yeah. Yeah. And uh and what about best practices? Oh yeah. Good point. Any tips for making sure my isolates are are playing nice? Definitely. So always, always be mindful of managing the life cycle of your isolates. Okay. You want to make sure they're properly shut down when they're no longer needed. Right. To prevent memory leaks. Yeah. And uh and as with any like performance optimization, right. testing is is crucial. Of course, yes. Don't just assume isolates are making things faster. Right. Measure measure the performance before and after. Okay. To confirm that you're getting that you know that desired speed boost. Right. Right. Don't just assume. Don't assume. Always test. So to recap, isolates are like these specialized teams yeah. that handle the heavy lifting in the background right? and keep my app's UI responsive and, and snappy. Yeah. Choose the the right implementation method, whether it's, you know, that, that convenient isolate.run mm -hmm. or the more hands-on manual approach. Yep, exactly. And always remember to log, yes. manage life cycles, mm -hmm. and test, test, test. Test, 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 test. All right. So we've got isolates covered. Sounds good. You ready to dive into the world of streams? Let's do it. Okay, yeah. That that blog post describes them as conveyor belts of data. Oh yeah, that's a good analogy. Yeah, I'm intrigued to to see how that plays out. It's really helpful. Just just imagine data slowing along this conveyor belt. Okay. And different parts of your app can can 
tap into that stream okay. to access the data in real time. Yeah. Go so ahead. you've got the source of the stream, you know, where the data originates. Right. And then you've got the listeners, which are the components that, you know, want to receive and process that data. Right. As it flows by. As it flows by. Yeah. Okay. I'm starting to, to see the picture, okay. but there's, but there are different types of streams, right? Right. The, the blog post mentions single subscription and broadcast streams. Yes. What's the like? What's the difference there, and yeah. how do I know which one to use? Great question. Think of a single subscription stream mm. as having one dedicated worker at the end of that conveyor belt. Okay. So only that worker can receive the data. Gotcha. A broadcast stream, on the other hand, is like having multiple workers. Okay. All positioned along the belt, and they're all able to you know observe and process the data simultaneously. Oh, uh, okay. I see. So it's like, are you sharing this with one specific component yeah. or are you broadcasting it out to, to multiple listeners? So for like, for something like an HTTP request where I only yeah. need one part of my app to handle the response, right? A, a single subscription stream would, would make more sense. Makes sense. Yeah. But if I'm dealing with like real time updates from a sensor, right? Where multiple parts of my app need to react. Yeah. Then, then a broadcast stream would be the way to go. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And here's a here's a key performance consideration. Okay. Single subscription streams are generally more efficient. Okay. Because they only generate data when there's an active listener. Gotcha. Broadcast streams keep keep chugging along. Oh wow. Whether anyone's listening or not. Yeah. Which can, you can be wasteful if if not managed carefully. Right. Efficiency is always a always a good thing. So we've got we've got the types of streams down. Okay. Now, how about creating them? Oh, yeah, creating streams. The blog post talked about transforming existing streams mm -hmm. using async generators. Yeah. And something called uh, stream controllers. Those are the three main avenues, yeah. Uh, transforming existing streams is is like modifying the data on that conveyor belt as it moves along. Oh, okay. So you can filter, you can modify or combine data okay. from an existing stream yeah. to create a new stream that, that's perfect for your needs. Okay. Async generators are are a very convenient way to create streams from functions right. that produce a sequence of values over time. Okay. So they're they're good for like, you know, things that happen uh, in sequence. Gotcha, gotcha. So if I so if I have an existing stream of data, I can use those transforming methods to like to shape it into exactly what I need. Exactly. Exactly. You can customize it. Okay. Cool. And and async generators are a handy way to create streams from functions that might take some time to complete. Yeah. Yeah. Things that, you know, are not instantaneous. Right, right. Okay. Now stream controllers. Yeah. Those are those are a bit more hands on. Okay. They give you they give you very fine grained control over the stream's behavior. Okay. It's like building your own custom data pipeline. Gotcha. Where you control exactly when data is added, right? How errors are handled, even how the stream reacts when a listener pauses. Wow! So, so it gives you it gives you a lot of flexibility. Sounds sounds powerful, but maybe a bit more complex. Yeah, definitely. I'm guessing they're they're best suited for for situations where you need like that extra level of control. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> you know, if you need if you need to really fine tune things, yeah. and and have that that very specific control, that's when stream controllers are are really useful. Okay. But but for for many cases, the the other methods, transforming existing streams or using async generators, yeah. those are often simpler and and can get the job done. Okay. So it's a bit to have all those tools in your toolkit. Yeah. And and know when to use each one. Awesome. Yeah, I think we've covered a lot of ground already. Yeah, we have. Isolates for, for heavy lifting, different types of streams for, for managing data flow and, mm -hmm. and even a glimpse into creating them. Right. So are we ready to tackle tackle the next level? Let's do it. All right. Let's explore how to really manipulate these streams and customize them. Okay, to, to fit our specific needs. That's good. Okay, so we're back and ready to like really dive deeper into streams. Right. We left off talking about transforming those those existing streams. Yeah. And using those async generators to make new mm -hmm. ones. Mm -hmm. So let's let's unpack that a bit more. Okay, sounds good. So so imagine you're getting a stream of of raw data right. from an API. Mm-hmm. And you only want to process certain types of data. Okay. That's where transforming comes in. So it's like like having a filter on our conveyor belt. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Picking out only the items we need. Yeah. Nice. Okay. The blog post mentioned a few methods, like map, where, and and expand. Right. These let you 
you know, modify the data flowing through the stream. Okay. Making it work for you. So let's say I have a stream of like numbers mm -hmm. and I only want the, the even ones. Okay. How, how could I use these methods to, to do that? Yeah. Good question. You could use the where method. Okay. To filter the stream. Right. Keeping only the numbers that, that satisfy a certain condition in this case being divisible by two. Right. Okay. It's like having a worker on the conveyor belt who, who checks each item. Mm -hmm. and only only lets the even numbers pass through. Okay, that, that makes sense. And what about map? How does that one work? Okay, so so think of map as like a, a transformation station Okay. on your conveyor belt. Okay. It, it applies a function to each element in the stream, okay. changing it into something else. Mm -hmm. So, for example, you could use map to, you know, convert a stream of temperatures in Celsius. Right. To Fahrenheit. Okay, so I give it a I give it a function, and it just applies that to every single one. Exactly to every single item on that conveyor belt. Gotcha. Okay, that's that's really powerful. And and what about expand? That one sounded interesting. Yeah, expand is is like having a worker mm -hmm. on that conveyor belt who can unpack boxes. Okay. It takes each element in the stream mm -hmm. and can generate multiple new elements from it. Okay. Essentially expanding the stream's content. Oh, okay. So if I so if I had a stream of like. API responses, right. and each response contain a list of items. Mm -hmm. I could use expand to like break those those lists apart, yeah, and treat each each item as a separate event. Exactly, yeah. It's like taking a package that's delivered on the conveyor belt, right, and unpacking it to process each item individually. Okay, that makes sense. This is this is giving me so many ideas for how to how to like manipulate data. Yeah. In my apps. Now, let's talk about async generators. Okay, they cool. sound like a convenient way to create streams. Yeah. Especially when dealing with with operations that that might take a while. Right. So, so imagine you're you're reading a large file mm -hmm. line mm -hmm. by line. Okay. An async generator lets you create a stream of of those lines from that file. Okay. Without without having to load the entire file into memory all at once. Gotcha. So it's like processing the file as it as it comes in on the conveyor belt. Okay. Rather than waiting for the whole thing to to arrive. That's that's really efficient. Yeah. And it seems like a, a perfect fit for for tasks like fetching data from an API. Yeah. Where the, the responses might might arrive in chunks. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Async generators are are a great tool to have in your belt. Yeah. When when you need to create streams from from functions that might not return all their data immediately. Okay. Yeah. So it's like it's like they give you that that flexibility to to work with data as it becomes available. Awesome. All right. We've covered transforming existing streams. Okay. We've covered using async generators. Mm -hmm. Now now let's tackle the the more you know hands on approach stream controllers. Right. I'm ready to to build my own custom beta pipeline here. Let's do it. Okay. So remember, stream controllers give you, they give you that fine grained control right. over how the stream behaves. Okay. You know, you can add data to the stream manually. Okay. Handle errors gracefully. Right. You could even manage pauses and resumes. Wow. That sounds, that sound, that level of control sounds really powerful, but yeah. maybe a little daunting. Yeah. What are, what are some scenarios where, where using a stream controller would be would be like the best choice. Okay, so think about think about a situation where where you're tracking user interactions. Okay. Like button presses, or swipes. Mm -hmm. You could use a stream controller to create a stream of those events. Right. Allowing other parts of your app to react to them in real time. So instead of having to manage those those events manually, mm -hmm. I could have like a stream controller pumping them out as they happen. Exactly. And any part of my app that needs to know about them can just you know listen to that stream that's the idea yeah okay stream controllers are, are really great for for situations where where you need to generate data from unpredictable sources mm -hmm. or or when you need that that very precise control over the stream's behavior okay i'm starting to see the appeal yeah but but the blog post mentions some some complexities with stream controllers it's yeah like honoring the pause and something called pause subscription synchronization right right those sound, those sound kind of technical. Yeah, they they are important concepts to grasp, especially when you're building you know more complex systems. Okay. Honoring the pause essentially means that that the stream should stop generating and buffering events. Okay. When a, when a listener has paused the stream. Okay, so if so if a part of my app like temporarily stops listening to the stream, mm -hmm. the stream controller should respect that pause. Yeah. And not just like waste resources producing data that isn't being used. Exactly. 
Exactly. And and that's where the string controller's callback methods come in. Okay. You can use the on pause callback to define what what actions should be taken okay. when the stream is paused. Like, you know, stopping a timer or closing a connection. Right. And then the on resume callback. Yes. Let's us specify what should happen when the stream when the stream resumes. Exactly. Yeah, like restarting that timer. Okay. Or reestablishing that connection. Gotcha. So it's it's like having having like really precise control over the flow of data mm -hmm. and making sure that that resources are are being used efficiently exactly yeah, yeah. it's about being a good steward of, of those resources right right now pause subscription synchronization that sounds <laughs> that sounds tricky yeah so so that that refers to a potential issue that can arise when the streams pause state okay and subscription status change at the same time at the same time okay yeah so so imagine imagine a scenario where uh, a listener tries to pause the stream mm -hmm. at the same time that another listener unsubscribes. Oh, okay. This this can lead to some unexpected behavior, right? If not handled properly. Okay, yeah, I can see how that would get get kind of messy. Yeah. So how do we avoid those those like nasty surprises? The the key is to to implement all four of the stream controller's callback methods. Okay. So you've got on listen, mm -hmm. on cancel, okay, on pause, right, and on resume. By by meticulously handling all those events, right, you you ensure that your stream controller behaves predictably, okay, and and avoids those those race conditions. So it sounds like stream controllers they they give us a lot of power, mm -hmm. but they they also demand like a deep understanding of of how they work, yeah, to avoid potential potential problems. Yeah, that's a that's a fair assessment. They are they are a powerful tool, right, but. But like any powerful tool, they need to be used responsibly, right? And and with a clear understanding of their capabilities and their limitations. Yeah. All right. Let's let's shift nears for a moment. Okay. And and revisit the the topic of error handling. Yeah. In streams. Right. We we touched upon it earlier, but I think it deserves like a bit more attention. Good point. How how do streams like gracefully handle handle errors? Yeah. And what what options do we have as as developers to to respond to them? Yeah, that's a great point. Error handling in streams is actually it's quite elegant. You know, as as we mentioned before, there's there's two primary ways streams behave. Right. When when errors occur, okay. They can either stop after the first error. Right. Or they can continue operating despite the errors. Okay. So it's like it's like deciding whether to stop a conveyor belt entirely. Oh, okay. If a single item is damaged. Right. Or to have mechanisms in place to to remove that damaged item mm -hmm. while keeping the rest of the items flowing. Right. Okay. So it depends on on how how critical it is to to have that that uninterrupted flow of data. So so the the choice of like which approach to use mm. really depends on the the nature of my data yeah. and and what my app needs to do. Exactly. If if the if the integrity of the data is is super important yeah, and, right. and and a single error could could like mess everything up yeah then stopping after the first error is is the safer way to go it's the safer bet yeah but but if you're dealing with like real-time data yeah where where occasional errors might be expected right you probably want that stream to keep going keep going okay yeah yeah in those scenarios continuing after errors allows your app to to remain responsive right and, and provide as much information as possible mm -hmm. even if there are those occasional hiccups so it's all about like choosing the the right error handling strategy right. for 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 the for the situation right and streams give you that flexibility yeah which yeah. is which is really powerful awesome all right now that we've now that we've explored how to create these streams yeah. how to how to manipulate them mm. and and even like gracefully handle handle errors yeah. i yeah. think we're i think we're ready to to tackle the the big one all right the big one using streams for state management ah uh, yes state management the, this this is the one that seems to to spark those those never ending debates yeah it's out of among flutter developers yeah. yeah some some people they swear by streams for for state management mm -hmm. and and others they're like whoa be careful you don't want to overuse those right so so what's what's your take on this well, like many things in software development, yeah, there's yeah. there's no there's no one size fits all answer. Right. The the decision of of whether or not to use streams right. for state management depends 
depends heavily on the specific needs of your app okay. and and your preferences as a developer. Okay, I'm I'm eager to unpack that. Yeah, let's let's dive into those nuances. Okay, of of using streams for for state management. Sounds good. Explore those those pitfalls we want to avoid, mm -hmm. and maybe even touch on some alternative state management approaches. Okay, you ready to to jump in? Let's do it. Okay, so we're back. And ready to to tackle like you know the big question swirling around streams. Yeah, are they the right choice for managing state? Yeah, it's a it's a question that comes up a lot. Yeah, in our Flutter apps, it's it's a it's a topic that can get pretty pretty heated. <laughs> it can get it can definitely get people talking. You know, in the in the dev community, and for sure, uh, streams. You know, with their ability to emit values over time, they right. they they seem like a natural fit for for representing changes in an app state. Yeah, it it seems like it would. Yeah, but it's but it's not always as straightforward as it appears. No, no, it's not always that simple. You know that that blog post we were we've been discussing. Yeah. Really, really highlighted that point. Like, not everything that changes needs to be a stream. Exactly. You, and and Randall Schwartz, he he specifically he warned against overusing them for for state management. Yeah, his his point is crucial often in in state management. Right. All we really need is the latest state. Yeah. to be reflected in the UI. We we don't always need a historical record of every single change. Yeah, so using using a stream to to broadcast every like tiny little state change mm. could be overkill. It could be. Yeah. Like in a simple simple counter app. Yeah. The the UI just needs to display the current count, right? Right. A stream like Blasting out every increment and decrement right. seems a little excessive. It's a lot. Of, it's a lot of noise for for not a lot of gain. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so when are streams like a good fit for for state management? Okay. So they they really shine when you have when you have a continuous flow of data that needs to be reflected in the UI in real time. Okay. And the order of those updates is is important. So I'm thinking things like like fetching data from a database yeah. or or handling real time messages in a chat app. Exactly. Yeah, like like those examples from that blog post. Right, right. Yeah. yeah. In those in those scenarios you've got a constant stream of of updates that need to be you know, processed and displayed as they come in. But even then, we still need to to be mindful of of performance, right? Absolutely. You uh -huh. you might want to use techniques like like throttling or debouncing, right? To to control how often the UI updates, especially if that if that data source is is super active. Right, right. You don't want it to like freak yeah. out. Yeah, you don't want to overwhelm things. Okay, that makes sense. So so for those times when when streams aren't the the ideal fit mm -hmm. for state management. Yeah. What are what are some some alternatives? Oh well, the the Flutter ecosystem yeah is is packed with with state management solutions. Yeah, provider Bilasi, Riverpod. Right. They they all offer you know different approaches mm. to managing those state changes. Yeah, it sounds like like choosing choosing the right one mm -hmm. really comes down to to like the specific needs. Yeah. Uh, of the app and and personal preference. Exactly. Yeah. the The key is to to understand those core principles. Yeah. Of of state management. Uh, how how do you how do you separate the state from the UI? Uh, how do you how do you propagate those those state changes efficiently? Okay. And and how do you test and debug your your logic? Right. Once once you've got those down, yeah, you can you can explore different different solutions. Yeah. And and find the one that that clicks for you. So wrapping this all up, yeah. isolates are, are are like heavy lifters. Yeah. They run those those demanding tasks behind the scenes. Mm. Keep the UI, keep the UI snappy. Right. Streams are like those data pipelines, perfect for, for managing real time flows of information. Yeah. But we need to we need to use them thoughtfully. Right. Especially when it comes to state management. Couldn't have said it better myself. Mm -hmm. Remember whether whether you're using isolates, streams, or any other technique. Yeah. The the goal is to create smooth, responsive experiences right. that make your your users happy. That's that's what it's all about. Yeah, that's the that's the ultimate goal. Well, this has been an amazing deep dive into Flutter performance. It has been. We've covered a ton of ground. Yeah. From from isolates to streams, mm -hmm. error handling, even dipping our toes into the sometimes choppy waters of state management. Yeah, we've we've covered a lot. It's been it's been a pleasure. Uh, exploring these concepts with you. Yeah. Hopefully our listener now feels 
uh, well equipped to tackle those those performance challenges. Yeah, and, and build those those blazing fast Flutter apps. And to our listener, keep experimenting, keep learning. Yes, and most importantly, keep building awesome things with Flutter. And that's a wrap on the deep dive. Happy coding, everyone. <laughs>